the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today's subject is decision-making. Why is it so hard for people to make good decisions around savings, investments, and money in general? We're joined by behavioral scientist Greg Davis, head of behavioral finance at Oxford Risk, and Ella Rabner, co-founder and chief marketing officer of Scalable Capital, to discuss. Tweet at us, at Rebank Podcast, or connect on Facebook or LinkedIn to join the conversation. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Greg Davis and Ella Rabner. Ella Rabner and Greg Davis, welcome to ReBank. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, so Ella, we've connected before on the podcast. You're a co-founder and chief marketing officer at Scalable Capital. That's correct. One of Europe's leading robo-advisors. One of the world's fastest growing as well. One of the world's fastest growing add, yes. All right. <laughs> and I would highly encourage anyone listening to to go back to that episode for a deep dive on scalable and kind of the the you know the robo advisory uh, vertical. Um, all the the excellent work that scalable is doing. And I think we got into some really interesting um, subjects around mm-hmm. diversity, women in finance, also, which is a huge passion of yours. Um, yeah. And your I was actually thinking just today, active in a very compelling um, and engaging way on on social media around some of these uh, massively important topics. So yeah, and actually just coming back from Frankfurt, where we had a women's event last night again, seventy one women. The room was completely packed. They were all very excited. Uh, questions, you know, lots of questions from the audience, very different ones from from the questions we typically see at our normal events, where mm-hmm. we have rather you know, let's say 80 to 90 percent men in the audience so um so it's a really rewarding topic to be working mm-hmm. on actually because i think we can really help women Excellent. Um, well it, you, yeah. you're doing amazing work and you know please you. please keep it up it's, it's really really great to see um and greg davis you'll have to to remind me what your precise title is at oxford risk uh, yes so I, I go by the title of uh, head of behavioral finance which of course can mean many things to many people, and I suspect we're going to dig into some of those in the course of this conversation. Yeah, great. So what better place to start than with uh, intros? Uh, Greg, maybe as it's the first time uh, you're joining us, you can you can mm-hmm. start. Tell us a bit about your background and, and what you focus on. Okay, well, I, I started life as an economist. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up, so I became a management consultant for a few years. Uh, and then at some point, I decided that I would be entirely self-indulgent and have an early midlife crisis and go back to university and do something entirely impractical. And so the idea was to go and do a PhD in the philosophy of rationality, which sounded like as about as far from practical as I could get. And as I was uh, reading up to put together a a proposal for this, I stumbled across this field, uh, which at the time was a very young and untested field, at least in terms of commercial application of behavioral economics and behavioral finance. And it just absolutely seemed to snap into into view for me. The fact that here was something that was in fact philosophical, it was about rationality, but it was also about finance, it was also about psychology, it was it was this mix of theory and practice. Uh, and it was taking something that I had studied, economics, and uh, and had been struggling with for years in the sense that the economics I studied never seemed all that useful to me (laughs) once I left university and started to put it into a context that was much more meaningful because behavioral finance and behavioral economics at its core are about studying how people actually make decisions rather than the bulk of economic theory which assumes that we know how people should make decisions and pretty much stops there. So I I thought this three-way conversation would be particularly interesting. So with the behavioral finance and decision-making angle, uh, 
that that Greg you bring uh, and and Ella with your experience um, engaging with with customers and also uh, watching how they interact with an investments platform uh, mm -hmm. maybe Ella I'd, I'd be I'd be interested just uh, you know kind of as, as we get going to to get your you know immediate thoughts on um, you know where the average personal investor comes from what some of the biggest um, challenges that uh, that you know investment managers that that providers that are that are assuming they're genuinely looking to uh, kind of support the best interests of customers over the long term what, what are the big you know what are the biggest challenges I think the nice the nice opportunity or the yeah the great opportunity that we have as an investment manager particularly as an, an algorithm driven investment manager basically is that we can take decision out of the hands of customers because that's where in the end the behavior manifests itself and that where behavioral pitfalls can create damage right um, because there are there are a couple of typical issues that you can observe with um, investors that manage their portfolios on their own um, stuff like you know loss aversion basically so once your portfolio goes into the red you basically you first don't want to realize it you want to you know, sit on it for a while, and then typically, you know, either what you do is, as soon as it's back up at zero, you're like, oof, wow, I, you know, I managed to bring that back up to zero, but now let me get out of it as quickly as possible because, boy, that was a bad experience, right? When, and I had a really couple of sleepless nights. really, it's the beginning nights. of a bull run or something. Yeah, and you don't, and you don't, you don't get the long-term return that you've invested um, for um, in the first place. Or it goes more and more negative, basically, and then you panic at some point, right? And you probably sell. It's the typical selling at the bottom, getting back in at the top type of behavior, which in the end will systematically lead to losses, right? If you do that all the time, then obviously you're just going to have a big loss. And, and I think overall the major challenge that people have is to do what Warren Buffett always is quoted as, as recommending – you know, the buy and hold strategy, right? Just buy something, something like the MSCI world, broadly diversified um, equities index. And then if you have a long enough time period for your investment, basically, you know, just hold it for 30, 40 years. Ideally, almost never look at it, right? You, people just don't do that, right? That's the problem. Um, because of, you know, all these experiences, um, they, they check their portfolios way too often, they get nervous, and then they sell. So what we are then really trying to do is to take those decisions out of the hand of investors by investing for them rather than having them invest themselves. Um, and then, I mean, obviously there are many other layers that we're adding to that, like selecting the best products for them and just making it more you know, time efficient for them and so on. But I think in the end, the big benefit is we use an algorithm that can look at data and that's completely unemotional mm -hmm. and makes data-driven decisions. And that's what people struggle with so massively. Greg, you spent ten years at Barclays. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of from from a you know practitioner's standpoint, developing yeah. I think some uh, some behavioral science driven solutions for yeah. them. Uh, That's right. What, what's 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 kind of your take on same question I asked Ella? You know, basically the the, the kind of the traditional uh, issues that personal investors uh, face when it comes to to making good decisions around investing. What? I think that investment decisions fall into this class of problems that are where the, the solution is simple but not easy. So telling someone how to be a good investor uh, really is just three things. It's not rocket science. One is put your wealth to work because leaving it sitting in cash for long periods of time is not going to get you anywhere. Two is uh, don't put it all in one thing, diversify. And three, once it's in, leave it alone. Now. If most people, most investors around the world, and here I'm not talking about professional investors necessarily, I'm talking about the retail market, wealthy people, less wealthy people, but people investing for their own account. If they simply did those three things, they would do better than most people out there, including a number of professional investors, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, the, problem are, the problem is all of those three things in their own way are emotionally uncomfortable to do. So just to give you the first one as an example, you know, why do people sit with so much of their cash doing nothing for so long? It's because when I'm making the decision in the short term, taking my money from somewhere safe and putting it somewhere risky is an emotionally uncomfortable thing to do. Um, and the same is true of all of the other things. I mean, people find diversification emotionally uncomfortable because it requires spreading your portfolio between a whole lot of stuff that you have no good story for. 
staying, leaving it alone is emotionally uncomfortable because if you see the markets going up and down, you, f- you feel you want to be doing something about it. So there is this inherent tension at the heart of all decision making where there is a, a trade-off between the right answer and the comfortable answer. And as humans, we all, we all go chasing off after the comfortable answer. Um, and as, as Ella has says, it costs you money along the way. So one of the solutions, and there are many, many solutions to this, is you put yourself at greater emotional distance from your investing. You step away from the decisions. Um, and you can use a, a robo-advisor to do that. You could use a human advisor to do that. But you're creating that emotional distance. Um, another one in keeping with, with what Ella was saying is, if we want to, as humans, reduce the emotional content of the decisions we make, take as many decisions as you can away from your future emotionally charged self and give them to yourself now when you can think cool, calm, and collectedly about them. Uh, In other words, try to find ways of pre-programming your future decisions so that you don't have to make them in the heat of the moment when you're emotionally stressed. Mm. So the 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 work that you do now at uh, Oxford Risk is is around basically providing tools to investment managers, wealth managers to use with their clients to help better gauge risk appetite effectively. That's right. Well, n- not just to gauge risk appetite, but to gauge all aspects of someone's financial personality. So gauging the right level of risk for someone to take requires thinking about their, their long-term willingness to trade off risk and return. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that in the short term, that is what people are going to be feeling. So in order to really get someone to a good investment outcome, we need to think not only about managing the investments, but about managing the investors. So we essentially provide software-based tools that are profiling tools. They They enable wealth managers to much more accurately and richly understand their customers' financial preferences and personality preferences. And B, they are decision support tools. They are tools that lead people step by step through complex decisions so that when they get to something that looks like the right answer, it is also a much more comfortable answer than if they had been had to if they had had to get there either themselves or had had that answer presented to them as, you know, we're the best, we understand what's best for you, here's the complex solution. That doesn't make people mm. typically very comfortable with that solution. But that, that, that's a really good uh, point maybe to pick up on. So basically this concept of not only do people need the right information, but they need to kind of uh, arrive at the right information um, with with confidence that they've been involved in the process, that they understand it, uh, mm-hmm. in, in order mm-hmm. to kind of you know in, in embody that and and progress it in, uh, in in a meaningful way over the long term. Uh, the, the the data we have say that that is true of some people, and this is why it's important to understand individual personalities. So there are people out there who will only be comfortable with their portfolio if they feel they have held the reins of the decision-making and they have controlled the decision-making. Um, that is very true of entrepreneurs who turn their hands to investing, for example. There are other people out there who will only feel comfortable with the portfolio if they feel that they have someone else to share the emotional burden of decision-making with. And those two people might and might require exactly the same portfolio as a result, but will not be equally comfortable with it unless they are taken through a path that is tailored to them, mm-hmm. unless they are communicated with in a way that is tailored to what makes them uniquely comfortable as, a, as an individual. And I guess for the, the, the advisor, the investment manager, <coughs> the challenge is effectively to support that person uh, given their decision-making um, style in it, maximizing investment returns or results yeah. or you know, long-term uh, well-being, which means behaving in different ways with, with different types of customers. Uh, I'd be interested, I guess, in uh, in both of your views, maybe Ella, to start as, as to whether... So it, it sounds like there are potentially numerous ways of, of dealing with this multifaceted challenge. Uh, some of them are probably uh, subjective and human and empathetic, and some of them are perhaps uh, you know, technology or software or algorithm-based. Uh, surely the right, the right solution involves some combination of the two, but I'd be interested in, in thoughts maybe from both sides. Ellie, you guys 
as you mentioned before, use algorithms to optimize uh, in investment strategies for your clients. How, how do you think about the impact of technology in helping address some of these uh, behavioral decision considerations? Um, so I think what you just said, really, um, Greg, really resonates um, in terms of what we sometimes see um, our investors basically say and, and how they sometimes behave. Because I, I would agree that there are investors that are probably likely to jump ship sooner or later if they not if they haven't been involved in the actual management of the portfolio, at least in some way. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're quite likely to jump ship because they will always find a benchmark out there that outperformed their own portfolio. Right. So if you've managed it for them and they have not been involved, they will always blame you and they will go somewhere else, you know, performance chasers, basically. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with you that, that there is a certain profile probably of person that would act like that, you know, like, you know, high performing, you know, entrepreneurs, like alpha males or alpha females equally, obviously, right. Um, and that is something that's a behavior that I think we need to, we need to figure out how to tackle because it's challenging, honestly, for the, I mean, the way we've set up right now is our primary goal is to take the portfolio management activity out of the hands of investors to make them better investors, basically. Um, we help them with risk management as well, um, which is incredibly difficult for them to do on their own because very often, but that's also the problem, very often people are not aware of if they keep managing their own portfolio on the side, for example, they're completely unaware of the risk that is in their self-directed portfolio. And it may be four times the risk sometimes that they have selected going through our onboarding process. And they're not even aware of that, right? And then during a period of a bull market, like what we had you know, last year, basically, they would look at their self-directed portfolio and they would say, hey, you know, I had like, I don't know, 17% this year in that portfolio, which had four times as much risk, but they're not aware of that. Um, and with you guys, I had, let's say, 11 Right? And then they'd be uncomfortable having us um, manage their money going forward. Um, and creating then that transparency across risk is incredibly difficult because if you have a self-directed portfolio, nobody has helped you doing what, what you're doing, what you guys are, are doing as well. Nobody's helping you to understand, you know, what's my risk preference? And then as a second step, obviously, does what I do, like how I invest right now, does it actually reflect that risk preference? Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So th that's a really challenging topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for the client who wants to be involved, we can't offer that yet. And I think sooner or later, it will be very hard for us to keep these people on board unless we find a way to maybe at some point give them a bit more decision-making ability to get, to get more buy-in, basically, from them. Mm -hmm. Right. Greg, this is, this is surely an age-old problem in the investment management space, you know, the wealth management space, mm -hmm. kind of helping basically getting customers up to the, the, the level of, of financial education, investment education that, that they need to not make, you know, to the, these, these terrible uh, decisions, uh, you know, cut and run mm -hmm. when, when the market pulls back 10%, mm -hmm. um, because that's just the way the world uh, works. If you're going to, uh, you know, optimize well-being o over the long term, you know, these three simple rules of thumb that you outlined before uh, are, you know, most of what there is to it. Um, Surely, investment managers have tried to educate and inform, hold customers' hands over time. What what is it uh, do you think about kind of where we are today that uh, that gives us better tools or a better ability to help drive mm. those messages home? Well, well, firstly, just as a as a side issue, I, d I don't think everyone needs to be educated. Um, you know, we you need to be comfortable, and that requires a certain amount of communication, but it does not require everyone out there to become a financial expert in order to participate effectively in the financial markets. Uh, and you're absolutely right. This is an, an age-old thing. Uh, we have known for a very long time that if you want your clients to stick with you, you have to make them comfortable. You have to keep them happy. You have to stop them from panicking. Um, the problem is that and, and, and we've become, in some ways, relatively good, good at doing that. So there is nothing in what I'm suggesting that a experienced, seasoned, empathetic, um, knowledgeable advisor who knows their clients well wouldn't be doing anyway. The problem is it can take 30 years to get to be that person. Uh, and most of us don't have access to, to those advisors. And even if you are that sophisticated, empathetic, knowledgeable advisor, 
The problem is we're all human. We all make mistakes. And I think there is no human process that cannot be enhanced uh, by looking at it, the addition of technology to pick up those pieces of the puzzle that humans aren't good at doing. Now, humans are not good at juggling lots of moving parts in their brains at one time. Humans are not good at, at processing large quantities of data to figure out who to talk to about what when. These are the things that we can do. So, that, so what has changed effectively is uh, our behavioral ability to profile pe people accurately very quickly that doesn't require you to have been a client of a particular advisor for 20 years. So we can shortcut that process. We can use data much more effectively to deliver targeted warnings and triggers so that advisors are prompted on when to talk to which client about about who, or indeed a digital system can deliver those, those prompts and communications yeah. automatically. Um, and then simply technology as a, as a delivery mechanism. So for me, a lot, of the, a lot of the future here is at the intersection between, um, between data, between digital, and between design. When we get these three things to come together and to do so effectively, for which we need the, the behavioral knowledge, then we are able to build these tools that can very quickly understand what people's needs are, what will make them comfortable and uncomfortable, and provide the delivery mechanism to, to help deliver decisions in a way that's uniquely and individually tailored to, to, what, uh, to what will make them more comfortable with the right answer. Mm. And if I, if I just might add to that, to that topic, because you touched upon it already, you know, few people are in, a, in the luxury position that they do have a human investment advisor that they can talk to, right? And mm. as much as we would want everyone to have access to that person, it will just not work because from a cost perspective, it's just yeah. not possible, right? Yeah. Um, so we are working, one of our major topics, basically, I think for the whole of next year as well, is the whole communications topic. So we call it digital handholding, basically, for our clients. Um, and that, it, that isn't meant at all to sound you know, patronizing in any way, right? But I think it is what every investor, even professional investors, could actually mm -hmm. need. Um, like data-driven with, um, as you also say, you know, good design, good UX, and just smart technology behind it. Um, so what we're trying to build now is a, is a CRM system where we have really all the data of the customer available to build communications routines on you know, signals-based, trigger-based, and so on. So we can see certain things happening in someone's portfolio, or we observe certain behavior indeed, like somebody is, um, you know, canceling their monthly savings plan, for example. Somebody's taking out a larger chunk of money. You know, using these events, whether they're external now or internal to the client, um, using those events to then tailor a communication around that. So you use... You use Existing building blocks, obviously, and, and you, can't, you don't individually write every message to the customer, right? But you think about a whole set of different messages and different scenarios, and you make sure that you send to each client, basically, the right message at the right time, and you do it through all the different channels that you have. So whether that's an email, whether it's, we obviously have apps as well, Android, iOS, and so on. So do, you, do you do it upon login into the app to make sure that the client actually sees it at the right moment? Do you, in some scenarios, potentially even reach out by phone to the customer? All of those things, basically. And I think that's going to be a real differentiator between investment managers, particular digital ones that are going to be successful in the future or not. Mm. I think it's delivering that whole journey because also with every message you send to the customer, you give them a reminder why they're actually with you and how you're creating value um, for them apart from just managing their money, mm -hmm. right? We've, we've approached this topic uh, purely through kind of an, an, an investments lens so far. Um, mm -hmm. Greg, I'd be interested um, to, to, I don't know, to get your thoughts uh, around where this maybe fits into a you know, broader kind of holistic you know, financial yeah. management well-being uh, conversation. And you know, specifically from, from a kind of a, a behavioral science standpoint, you know, it, investments is, um, you know, broadly speaking, in, inherently complicated. Uh, you can be the type that wants to understand all the detail. You can be the, the, the type that wants to outsource that to uh, mm -hmm. an investment manager. But there, there's no real way of getting around the fact that there are a lot of moving parts uh, in, yeah. in, in that world. Um, you know, broadening the conversation to finances in general and the interplay between various verticals. I'd be interested mm -hmm. in, your, in your thoughts. Well, the number of moving parts doesn't decrease. Um, I think that 
figuring out what the right thing to do with your finances is inherently complex, uh, even if your finances are simple, because there are lots of choices. Imagine someone who has saved a few hundred pounds at the end of the month. You know, what do, what do you do with that? Well, I could leave it doing nothing in my current account. I could put it into my savings account. I could pay it into my ISA. I could put it, in, transfer it into my pension. Uh, on the other side of the balance sheet, I could you know, pay off the loan that I owe to my brother-in-law, I could pay down my credit card, I could pay down my mortgage, I could buy insurance. So even the simplest financial or, or, decision or, is... Or, or from, you know, from a, I'm an emotional creature, I could, I could spend it. You know, or you could guys spend it. Yeah, have a, month, have a, I could buy my time. friend a oh gift. My God, you know, all spend all it. <laughs> <laughs> but this, Scary. <laughs> this, this is one of the, the, the fundamental problems because figuring out the right answer is inherently complex. And what we as humans do when we're faced with a daunting and a complex task, particularly one where the consequences of the decision are not immediate, they only play out over long periods of time, is we simply step away from that decision and we either make no decision, in other words, we leave that money sitting doing nothing in our current account, or we go out and spend it. Now, you're absolutely right. These same techniques that we can use to lead people to better investment behavior can be used in a much broader context for financial well-being at large. And it boils down to much the same thing. So understanding your financial personality and your proclivities. So one of the 10 financial personality scales that we measure is an impulsivity scale, which is people's tendency to make emotionally driven decisions or to, to overspend. And once we know that about someone, you can start changing the way you communicate with them in various ways. But I think one of the, the biggest problems here is our financial system is in no way set up to solve this problem for people. We expect people over the course of their lives to cobble together their entire their own financial structure from a bunch of products that are thrown at them over the years. And there's no reason to believe that the, the financial structure, the, the, the set of accounts and the set of uh, loans and a, a set of insurance that I have accidentally built for myself over a long period of time is in any way optimized. The other thing we don't do, so so we've got these sort of you know, cobbled together systems and very little assistance is given in how to automate those things. And we go back to the, the point we had earlier. If you want to help people make better decisions, enable them to pre-program their future behavior. Take a, most people don't need to make 95% of the decisions they make. They could have made that decision for life, pre-programmed it, and then it would just happen automatically. So I think there's a whole class of tools missing. Can you give us an example of that? Um, so this, this few hundred pounds that I've got in my system, right, I, I want to save it. I want to push it down the system so that you know, if, if my buffer account is full, it overflows, it goes into the longer-term savings, etc. Now... If I every month have to figure out what to do with the money left over, how to make all of the transfers between all these accounts and pots and, and savings containers that I have to do, um, and if, if I need money, if I need to pull money out, I have to make all the decisions and I have to make all the transfers. That system is placing an incredible cognitive and decision burden on a, on a human. If, again, I could design a system for someone that, in collaboration with them, they could configure, and they go, when that money comes in every month, it would automatically flow through the system in this way. And if I need to pull money out, here's the set of rules by which it would come out. You've basically taken away most of the financial decisions that people need to make month by month. You've made their life much easier. You've automated the system. You've optimized the system. And as a financial services industry, we throw products at people. We don't think about the ecosystem. And frankly, for decision making, helping people to build an ecosystem is much, much more important than giving them optimized products. Mm. And what you just mentioned is something we will actually be able to do because of PSB, a PSD2, yeah. the Payment Services Directive, right? Because it would allow us, and Scalable can't do that right now, but it would be a very interesting field to explore to basically allow a client to connect their bank account or accounts basically to their scalable account, like give us full transparency on that, and then set up a rule where basically they don't have just, you know, what we already offer, a, a fixed amount, monthly savings plans or whatever, every month it's 500 pounds or whatever mm. it is, but to basically make that, you know, rule space kind of where, for example, you say whenever I have more than a thousand pounds sitting in that current account, then invest the... Uh, remainder basically everything exceeding the thousand pounds invest that into scalable 
mm-hmm. right? Or top it up from scalable yeah. because you know we invest in TTFs. We can sell them every day, pretty much. So you could also say if it goes, if it drops below or something like this, then you know sell some of my stuff for scalable and put more money into the account. So you could set up a rule like that, and you set it up once, and just like you said, you then take away the decision. Mm-hmm. And, and also the work, basically, for you know every month to look at it, what to do with it. You just set up a rule, and then it just does it kind of automatically for you, right? Yeah. I think that would be great behavior to encourage. The problem with these systems is they, they you know, again, it's, it's sort of simple but not easy. They take a lot of thinking through to, to build them. And it's much easier to build a savings product and try to sell it to people than it is to build a system where you can start to help people automate mm-hmm. their lives. Um, but, you know, these are all things that fall into this category of decision support tools that are our expertise at, at Oxford Risk. So whilst we are focused primarily on, on investment management, on investing, uh, we have done a number of side projects in the last 12 months looking specifically at the broader issue of financial well-being. Mm. Because for, you know, investing is, is a segment of a much bigger pie, which is you know, how do I help people to navigate the irreducible complexity of their financial existence? Mm. And open banking, open data, PSD2 is one part of that. Because firstly, in order to do that, I need to give people a picture of their whole existence. But I need to be able to portray it back to them in a way that's um, visually appealing, Mm -hmm. that thinks about the emotional responses people have to viewing numbers, which aren't always good, um, and then enables you to go that next step and help people to configure these systems for them. And I think we're moving in that direction where we can increasingly start to use technology as a decision prosthetic. So a tool to help people become more consistently the best versions of themselves mm-hmm. that they can be. <clears throat> I'd be interested in, in both of your views on on something. So we're, we're living in this like in, increasingly short attention span world. Um, and Greg, I think you alluded to it earlier it, in investments and making good long term uh, savings decisions is, is basically one of the uh, kind of least uh, instant gratification uh, activities that we can engage in. So, Unfortunately. right. So, so but, but of course, it's also one of the most impactful. So yes. how do you get people excited about uh, you know, outlining a you know multi-decade savings plan that's going to set set them up for you know the the, the lifestyle they want uh, when they stop working uh, mm-hmm. and keep them you know engaged when in, you know they could be checking their Facebook feed instead of you know mm-hmm. uh, thinking think about it's it. difficult to get people excited, but there are particular points at people's lives where they poke their head above the parapet and start to pay attention. So, um, you know birth of first child is is the most common one where people suddenly start thinking about their finances. Um, I think there's a, we don't need people to be engaged all the time in all aspects of their finance. If we have automated good decision making, then actually what you're doing is you're saying you don't need to be engaged because the system you've built has, has, has got you, you know, we've got your back there. You need to get people engaged in developing the system. And that's the important bit. And there I think we can we can borrow a lot of techniques from, uh, you know, what's uh, sometimes rather um, inaccurately called gamification. Uh, and just to be clear, by gamification, I do not mean going out there and building games. I do not mean trivializing the problem. I mean borrowing tools and techniques that can lead people, in often in a gaming environment, very quickly to sophisticated patterns of behavior in a complex environment. And if we borrow those techniques, which are about designing ways in which we can make people feel comfortable with moving progressively towards more and more complex things. Give them points, give them badges, give them levels. And the answer, unlike most of what the financial services uh, industry has done over the last century, is not work out the complex right answer and give it to them. The answer needs to be, if we know what the complex right answer is, that's only the start. We then need to figure out how to take them from level one to level two to level three to level four so that they finally attain that complex right answer without being put off along the journey. It, it, well, I guess from, from your standpoint, there, there's kind of a, another interesting component, which is traditionally you know, investment managers have kind of you know, spent a lot up front to acquire customers. And then it's like, okay, once I've got them hooked then they're never going to think about this again, right? Like, you know, they'll, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll call me in 30 years when they're retiring or whatever. So it's just like a constant cash flow stream. Oh, and I'm going to be gouging them uh, in fees along the way. 
you know, surely they're 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 multi, you know, they're they're, they're multiple components for uh, for a, a digital investment platform to think about. Um, yeah, absolutely, and I also want to add add one more element to what Greg just said. I think creating transparency is something that's incredibly powerful because. Um, you know, it may sometimes be difficult to to get people to even look at their finances, basically, and that's the main challenge that we have, and I in particularly have because I'm running the marketing for Scalable, right? Um, but even when they when they look at it, basically, the question is, how do you get them excited? And I think for us, it's a little bit. We, we've built a tool basically that we call Time Machine, which is is um, aimed at creating transparency around what does it take to get you from here depending on where you are in terms of age and income and so on, to there where you want to be in retirement, right? And I think creating this transparency is incredibly important because most people have never realized how much they would have to pay in either now or in the form of a future monthly savings plan in order to get to a lifestyle in retirement that they want to have, right? So most people probably have that you know, gut feeling that maybe they are probably not doing enough, to have a good retirement but then as you say as, as, as long as it's complex and it's kind of you know you don't really have a grip around it you don't know what the real number is you don't know how the big the problem is you, you just don't you just postpone it you know you're like yeah I'll look at it tomorrow I'll look at it in a week in a month whatever plus I think we probably all <laughs> yeah, uh, on on you know on on some level or another assume that uh, you know we, we will you know sort out this issue because We'll sell our next company, or we'll yeah. inherit some money, It'll be or fun. you know, yeah. win I'll the lottery, more money, or whatever you know, it is, right? And I'll so get a promotion. Not, not I'll change deal, right? jobs. You know, it's like it's exactly why people in their twenties usually don't invest, right? Because they think, oh, now I finished university, now it's time to actually enjoy life. You know, I go to uh, you know better hotels. You know, um, don't just fly. You know, low cost airline, but maybe pick you know a nicer one. And uh, they want to indulge a little bit, and that's fine. They want to reward themselves for the hard work that they have put into their education. Hopefully, yeah. Um, um, but then they always think or they always assume, oh, it's going to be easier to start investing next year in five years, whatever, because I'm going to earn more and so on. And then all of a sudden they've got the first child and they're like, oh, hell, I actually net net now. Maybe I have less than before. Right. And I still mm-hmm. haven't started saving. So what we are then really trying to do is to give people a tool where they can input very basic parameters around, you know, their gender, which would be used for life expectancy and so on. Um, their their um, in, immediate investment amount, like how much could you pin, put in right now? How much could you do you think you could put in on a monthly basis? And then they can look at what does that mean when I reach retirement? Basically, what does that mean inflation adjusted for my payout? How much will I be able to take out of my um, investment account on a monthly basis once I retire? Depending on how long I think I'm going to live. So we will basically tell them here's our, you know, based on insurance data and so on, here's our expectation for how long you might live given when you were born and so on. But you can adjust that. You can also say, I want to be super conservative. Let's see what happens if I'm going to live until I'm 100, right? And then we show you, and also do I want to give money to my kids, basically, or not, right? Do I want to consume everything I have until I die or not? And then we show them this amount. And I think for a lot of people, it's quite scary that they then see, oh, you know, with the current parameters and given my age, maybe I'm only going to have in today's money, I don't know, 600 pounds a month. And then they're like, holy, you know, I need to do something, right? And then I think by creating that transparency, you then create that pressure or that, yeah, that need to really take action. Because if they don't have that transparency, it's very, very easy to postpone that problem. Right? But if you tell them you're really far away from where you would be, you actually are, unless you do something about it, and you give them the tools to then tell them this is how, what you would need to do to get to where you want to be, it becomes all of a, lot, a, lot, uh, all of a sudden a lot more tangible. And then I think that's the moment where I think that a lot of people decide, oh, I really need to do something now, particularly if I can outsource it so I don't have to you know, read stock market news mm. every weekend, which I probably don't want to do. The problem is, though, that a lot of people still don't. So yeah, don't, don't what? Don't don't get involved at that point. Mm. So if Even you then, if yes. you show people you don't have enough, you need to do something about it. Um, there is still this myopia of well, I can make that tomorrow's problem, and in some cases you exacerbate that problem because people don't like to think about psychologically uncomfortable mm. things. <laughs> so so you get you get the, the sort of ostrich and... effect. I'll just stick my head in the sand and, and forget about it. So. Um, you're right. I mean, we need to be able to lead people to clear and transparent ways of seeing what the problem is. Um, that 
doesn't always solve the problem, sadly. And, and there's no easy solution to this. Um, you know, a lot of people really do not start acting for their long-term future until it's almost too late, or in some cases, genuinely too late. I think the question then, though, is at some point, what, what can you still do? You know, If yeah. you create transparency and you give them as easy a solution as possible, basically, and they still don't take it, it becomes challenging at some point. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, I mean, this is where... You know, behavioral techniques like uh, like nudge or to enrollment, for example, have mm-hmm. helped yeah, to I wouldn't say yeah. solve, but to approach that problem in a useful way. So the assumption there is, for large swathes of of uh, you know society, if people left to their own devices cannot or will not do it themselves, then we will automatically enroll them in, and they have to take action to uh, to take themselves out if they want. The problem with something like automatic enrollment is, amongst other things, it's also an invitation to disengage any further because you give people the the sense that someone clever has solved this problem on your behalf mm-hmm. and that you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and that's that can be a massive problem because if, if people are automatically enrolled, sure, they're now saving something where they weren't saving before. They're building a pension. But they're not building any expertise or capabilities over the next 30 years to the point where they come to retirement and suddenly have to make some very pressing and very complex decisions uh, without due preparation. So in my view, we always have to try to balance the, the nudge side, the choice architecture, the automatic side with actual attempts to engage, mm-hmm. looking for those life events where people are having a child, thinking about their future, finishing college, whatever it may be, uh, and trying to use those as engagement points. Guys, uh, to, to wrap up, maybe uh, we can we can guide people to where they can uh, find out more about your work, where they can open a, a scalable account. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have a website, obviously. It's, it's uh, scalable.capital. Um, we are currently um, operating in four markets, so here in the UK. Um, regulated by the FCA, but also in uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Um, we have, I believe, a, a pretty good blog, basically, where we where we publish articles almost on a weekly basis. Some of them also on behavioral finance, but many other topics um, as well. We also have apps in the App Store. So just look for Scalable Capital in the App Store. We've just redesigned our iOS app. I'm very excited. Android is going to follow within uh, the next one or two weeks. Um, so I think very um, beautiful, user-friendly app. Um, yeah, so that's where you can find out more. Excellent. Greg? Yeah, and for Oxford Risk, um, it's good timing. We have just revamped our website and, and uh, relaunched it, which is partly because we have just launched our completely integrated uh, suite of suitability tools. So in there are the standard tools for risk tolerance assessment, but we have a completely unique assessment of risk capacity uh, unique to the market. We have all of these behavioral scales I've been talking about, so we can measure up to 10 different facets of financial personality, plus for uh, advisors, the knowledge and experience component. So oxfordrisk.com is where you would go for the website. Um, we're also active on uh, on Twitter, obviously, and as am I, uh, Greg B. Davis, uh, I-E-S at the end. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, also lots of blogs and other information content yeah. going out there. And people can keep an eye out for you on the speaking circuit as well. Uh, right? Yes, or, or or the or the lecturing circuit, right? With your with your professor's hat on. I do I do a little bit um, to keep me keep my hand in through the year. Uh, you know, one teach one course a year at Imperial. Uh, do bits and pieces at Oxford. So excellent. Brilliant. Uh, Ella Ravener and Greg Davis, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning into Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.